Canada's Prime Minister says his country is doing more to welcome refugees. But with a cap on private sponsorships, is Canada a migrant's best friend or a country with good PR? I'm Imran Gata, and today's newsmaker is Canadian Immigration. After the White House tried to order a ban on immigrants, Canada responded. Mexicans got visa-free travel. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made a promise to refugees. He tweeted, To those fleeing persecution, terror and war, Canadians will welcome you regardless of your faith. He then posted a picture of himself greeting a Syrian child at Toronto's airport. But despite the goodwill gestures, Canada ranks 15th in the industrialized world for hosting refugees. And after private citizens sponsored 14,000 refugees last year, the government quietly capped the number of applicants to a mere 1,000. So do Justin Trudeau's policies really match the rhetoric in his tweets? We'll have a look at that in a moment. But first, we have this report by Natalie Pahonen. Justin Trudeau is the picture-perfect politician. Under his premiership, Canada's refugee policy credentials have been touted far and wide. No more so than when his newly elected government promised to take in 25,000 Syrian refugees. And it did. Fast forward to 2017 and the newly sworn in president south of the border was vowing to impose a travel ban on seven predominantly Muslim nations. Trudeau countered with this message. To those fleeing persecution, terror and war, Canadians will welcome you regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength. Hashtag welcome to Canada. A division clearly on display at their first meeting. We cannot let the wrong people in, and I will not allow that to happen during this administration. We continue to pursue our policies of, of uh, openness uh, towards immigration and refugees without compromising security. The change in U.S. politics has had an immediate effect on its neighbour. And the Trudeau government has been criticised for not being proactive and preparing for a refugee influx. A surge of people who's crossed over illegally to lodge asylum claims in Canada. Many undertaking the journey in harsh winter conditions. That increase has created a backlog of claims, testing the integrity of the Canadian immigration system and raising concerns about the security risk for the country. A poll earlier this year showed 48% of Canadians were in favour of sending illegal arrivals back to the US. Canada ranks 15th on the list of industrialised nations which accept asylum seekers. This year, the Canadian government is planning to take in 25,000 refugees. But more than half will be privately sponsored by individuals or community groups, and they alone will take responsibility for the newcomers. Raising questions about the generosity of the government, and the Prime Minister, who has actively promoted Canada as a leader in addressing the world's refugee crisis. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Toronto is former Canadian Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Chris Alexander. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Good to have you on the programme. I know you're from the other side of the political fence. However, are you impressed by or proud of the current immigration policies under the Liberals? I am actually a huge fan of our refugee resettlement programs, our asylum programs, and our immigration programs. I think it is a comparative advantage for Canada globally. It's made our economy strong, uh, and it's allowed us to show leadership at a time of, of great humanitarian crisis in the world. But uh, yes, I have some real issues with how our liberal, new liberal government is approaching this issue. They are creating incentives for irregular migration to Canada to grow, which will undermine our ability to do safe refugee resettlement on a large scale. And I worry about what that holds for the future. Okay, so when you say irregular migration, are you referring maybe specifically to the Mexicans who are now crossing the border? It's visa-free for them to go as tourists, but many want to work in Canada. They're being detained, as, as far as I understand. 
Canada detained more Mexican migrants in the first two months of 2017 than it did in all of 2016. That was more than 400 people. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, we lift visa requirements for countries on the basis of objective criteria. We evaluate how many asylum claims there, be, there have been, how many people overstay their visas. When we see stability, when we see uh, a normalization of those people-to-people -people relations between us and a, and, and a partner country, then we lift the visa requirement. And we've done that for dozens of countries in recent decades. Uh, those criteria haven't been met in the case of Mexico. And so instead of giving hundreds of thousands of Mexicans uh, visas, multiple entry visas, and holding them to account to uh, respect the terms of those visas, now we're asking all Mexicans, giving all Mexicans the opportunity to come here with visa free without being able to evaluate whether they are criminals, part of uh, drug cartels, or here for the wrong reasons. Right. And so yes, asylum claims are going up. We had back in 2008 uh, almost 10,000 asylum claims just from Mexico. And that's a problem because it takes resources away from uh, helping true refugees, those who are coming, fleeing conflict, those who really deserve Canada's protection and Canada's support. Yeah, something that's really interesting in a Reuters piece, Alejandro Becerra was profiled, a 30-year-old former bank teller from Mexico City. He spoke of a construction job that he was offered in Canada. He went on the visa-free regime. The immigration officer asked him, why are you coming into Canada? He said, I'm here as a tourist. They looked at his phone. They found there was communication regarding the potential job offer. Of course, they detained him and then they sent him back to Mexico and I'm, I'm presuming he's sort of banned in some way or another. Now, ironically, Canada seems open and making it visa-free for Mexicans makes Canada seem even more open. Ironically, that sounds very much like somebody being treated by Donald Trump's America. Hey, why are you here? You want a job? Go back, we're gonna send you back. So is Canada gonna find itself in these kind of moral and uh, political, hypocritical conundrums? <laughs> I, I, I very much hope not. I mean, listen, Donald Trump came to power in the United States for various reasons, controversy over trade, jobs. But one of the reasons was a large population in the United States of people who came there by irregular and often very dangerous means and who are there in an undocumented way. That creates controversy. Uh, Obama couldn't deal with the issue despite uh, deporting larger numbers than any previous president. Uh, and Trump promised to deal with the issue. I doubt very much that he's on a course to success. But the restrictions he's put in place mean that Canada needs to respond. I think we should be generously uh, receiving those asylum claimants who will no longer uh, have their cases heard in the United States and doing that at our borders. I think we should be doing more than our Trudeau liberal government uh, is doing. But at the same time, we should be working very hard to avoid the situation the US and many European countries found themselves in, where this huge part of the population don't have their rights respected, don't have regular immigration status, uh, and have come here, often thanks to human smugglers or other networks that help them, in spite of the rules, uh, mm -hmm. by, by circumventing the rules. Rule-based immigration, rule-based refugee resettlement are the solution for the future. And we would like to see more of Canada's resources go to resettling Syrian refugees resettling uh, people who are fleeing conflict in Central America, resettling people who are fleeing, fleeing conflict in South Asia, rather than going to people who are coming from relatively safe countries and simply breaking the rules. This is interesting because you say rule-based, right? But that's really flexible and elastic, isn't it, given the current nature of all these conflicts? As somebody who would have been evaluating these things as they went along as the immigration minister, who gets to decide which conflicts take uh, preference, which are the priority conflicts? So, okay, you say Syria, uh, maybe Iraq, Yemen, you said Central America. What if you're an Afghan fleeing? At the moment, Afghanistan is not deemed a place in a state of war, so many Afghan refugees in many parts of the world are sent, sent back only to more bombs and chaos in places like Kabul. So which countries are, are top of the pile? Mm. Well, listen, anyone who gets here and makes an asylum claim uh, will have that claim heard. And the success rate for Afghan claimants has gone up in recent years. Uh, I think the number was between 500 and 1,000 successful claims last year. Uh, so it's not for me to decide which 
claims are valid. We do that with our professional immigration and refugee officers working with the UNHCR, working with other partners, and with a, an impartial immigration and refugee board in Canada that makes decisions in these cases. But Canada has a privilege that other countries don't have in Europe, uh, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and elsewhere, because we do not have borders close to your part of the world, close to Syria and the ma major sources of new refugee uh, uh, flows, we can continue to have re expect relatively low levels of asylum claims while increasing our safe refugee resettlement. I am a firm believer that the best solution is to have larger numbers of countries taking refugees directly from camps in Georgia, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and other places, bringing them safely to our countries instead of forcing them to take dangerous journeys over land or uh, those perilous voyages on the Mediterranean, which have cost 25,000 lives since the year 2000. Right. That is a cost that is far too high for humanity to pay. Uh, and I would like to see Canada manage its asylum claims well uh, so that we don't have abuse and increase its refugee resettlement from Syria and elsewhere. Before the Liberal government came in, we had resettled successfully 26,000 Iraqi and Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. No other country had done that. And your earlier point about us having low numbers of, of refugees in Canada per capita, that only applies to asylum seekers. If you take asylum claimants out who actually vote with their feet and look at safely resettled refugees who are brought here by states and in our case by private sponsors, we have the highest uh, effort, level of effort in the world. And I think a lot of countries are taking interest in, that, in our experience uh, and looking to emulate it in future. So would you suggest that there shouldn't be a cap on private sponsorships? Absolutely not. It is one of the biggest mistakes of this current government to refuse the generosity of Canadians to say, no, you've brought these resources together in your mosque, in your church group, in your community group. We are not going to help a Syrian with that. Instead, we're going to use taxpayers' money. All the re research shows mm -hmm. that private sponsorship leads to better outcomes. Right. Uh, it leads to more success for refugees, and we should not be capping that effort on the part of Canadians. Mm -hmm. I want to pivot to something that is deeply personal um, for you and happened towards the end of your time in the administration, the Alan Kurdi issue, that little boy who washed up on the beaches of, of Turkey, a Syrian refugee, a uh, young boy, he and his family, well, many members of his family didn't make it. You were hammered for it because presumably, initially, it was said that you rejected his father Abdullah's asylum application. It turned out that you'd rejected his uncle's application. It had nothing to do directly with the family. You still got hammered for it. And it, there was a stain on the entire administration, the entire, the, the entire Harper administration. I know you got a lot, a lot of ugly criticism as well and uh, trolling for it. In retrospect, what would you have done differently? Well, first, that was a heartbreaking moment for the whole world uh, to see this boy's body. Uh, I've had the chance to relive it with uh, Alan Curdy's aunt, Tima Curdy, who lives in Coquitlam, British Columbia. Uh, we hugged each other. We told our respective stories. Uh, we're still uh, broken and, and, and haunted by those memories. But Syrians, and many of us, are haunted most of all by the failure of the international community to stop these refugee flows and to stop the conflict. Uh, and so what would we have done differently? What would I have done differently? I think we should have acted faster, earlier, to do more. I was the first minister in any country in the world, including the United States, uh, to announce that we would safely resettle 10,000 Syrian refugees. We did that in January 2015, nine months before Alan Kurdi's death. Uh, but we should have implemented that faster and scaled up faster as the crisis uh, hit uh, uh, new, new peaks of urgency in the summer of 2015. I didn't have the support of all of my colleagues in government at that time. I don't think they saw how important this issue was going to be. Uh, and we should have done more faster. But I fault the current government for not sustaining the effort that they, the, the, the higher pace of resettlement that they maintained for a few months after coming into office. 
uh, as you pointed out, it has dropped off. We shouldn't be acting on the basis of political expediency. We should be acting on the basis of humanitarian urgency. And I would like to see us doing more to stop the war, to ensure Bashar al-Assad is not able uh, to kill his own people on the scale he has done now for six years. Uh, and I would like to see Canada showing leadership on refugee resettlement. There are many countries in the world, in Europe and elsewhere, that could be safely resettling more refugees. But that has to go together with a rule-based system uh, and reforms of the asylum system to make sure these hundreds of thousands of people who've fled for their lives across the Mediterranean are not exposed to the dangers that we've seen over the last couple of decades. Uh, it's a big agenda, but I think there are solutions. Uh, and yes, some of those lessons uh, have to be drawn from our election and from our reforms and our efforts to live up to our reputation uh, for humanitarian action. We're celebrating the 100,000 plus Vietnamese boat refugees we brought here under a conservative government initially uh, a few decades ago. We should, be make, we should be undertaking an effort on that scale or an even larger scale, I think, for refugees fleeing the current conflict in Syria and Iraq. Typical polite Canadians, you know, when I cover other stories, usually the politician from the other side of the fence only <laughs> flings dirt at the current administration. It's been fantastic talking to you, Chris Alexander. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Coming up on the program, as Colombian rebels lay down their weapons, are they at risk of assassination? And are Crimean Tatars looking for more rights as Ukrainians, or should they be treated as another separatist group? After numerous delays, FARC rebel fighters are finally set to hand over all of their weapons. It's being hailed as a major success of the peace deal signed between the group and Colombia's government. But as the FARC disarm, is President Santos keeping up his side of the deal? The government has been slow to build resettlement camps, and there are concerns that as the former fighters lay down their weapons, they could be putting themselves in danger. Yvette McCullough has more. After more than five decades of armed conflict, another move towards peace as the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia lay down their weapons. Con este acto, With this event, the FARC want to show to the country and to the world that we are closing a chapter in the history of our country and beginning to write another, that of peace. I felt sad to hand over my rifle. I feel sad and at the same time relieved because we're showing the country that we're doing what we said. As part of Colombia's historic peace deal, the FARC was meant to hand over the weapons of its 7,000 members by May 30th. But the deadline was extended after FARC commanders complained about delays in building special camps to house demobilized fighters. Serán 20 días adicionales para el desarme y 60 para la reincorporación. No es nada, nada para terminar bien 53 años de enfrentamiento y violencia. By mid-June, the FARC had handed over 60% of its registered weapons and said it would be able to honour the deadline. But as FARC rebels disarm, there's concern they're making themselves an open target. Once disarmed, the FARC will become a legitimate political movement with seats in Colombia's Congress. That's angered many Colombians including right-wing paramilitaries who have targeted the FARC in the past. As part of the controversial peace deal, 315 demobilized rebels will be trained by Colombia's National Protection Unit to be official paid bodyguards. The FARC says this is necessary because they fear their members will be attacked like the Patriotic Union Party in the 1980s. The left-wing party was almost completely wiped out after dozens of its members were murdered. And the FARC says it only trusts its own people to give protection. But for many Colombians, re-arming and training rebels who have only just given up their weapons is unthinkable and isn't a commitment to peace at all. Will the FARC meet its disarmament deadline 
And will it be the beginning of the peace Colombians have been promised? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, uh, let's speak to Darinel Rodriguez-Torres, who joins me from New York. He's the executive director of the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. And from Bogota, Andre Gomez Suarez, director of Rodimos El Dialogo, an initiative supporting Colombia's peace negotiations. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Darinel, if I can begin with you, what is the biggest hindrance to disarmament? The biggest hindrance to disarmament? Well, the disarmament process has uh, been going on with uh, some small delays, but, uh, uh, but I think very minor, no? like uh, it was uh, showed in the uh, document that you just uh, aired. There is a 20-day delay into the whole disarmament process. This is a very complex process of disarmament. It's perhaps one of the most uh, technically competent processes with international verification of the UN. So despite the delays, I'd say the process of disarmament is in, it's in good track. Andre, are you happy with how President Santos has managed this process? Yeah, I, I think uh, President Santos has shown an incredible amount of leadership. Uh, this is a very complex process. Uh, 53 years of war divides a society. And I think we needed someone like President Santos to try to uh, honor uh, the agreement that he reached with the FARC uh, in November last year. And given, Andre, that the voters didn't want this, and it was just by a, by a hair's breadth, it was 50.2%, given that the voters didn't want this, he still went ahead, and they still have all these problems where you have right-wing paramilitaries attacking the FARC themselves. You have the ELN attacking people and kidnapping people, some FARC members themselves breaking away. With all of that, would you accept and understand why many Colombians still feel they're not sure if this is worth it and they're not sure if there will be peace with justice? Of course. I talk to Colombians every day. You know, we're here in the country. We understand that it's very complex to understand uh, what's going on and the commitments that the state had to do in order to disarm the FARC and all the efforts that the FARC had done in order to put an end to a war that uh, produced more than 8 million victims. But, you know, I think what the international community and your audience needs to understand is that the plebiscite was won with an awful amount of lies and uh, the promotion of misunderstandings by a sector of the Colombian political elite that didn't want the deal. And actually, the margin which uh, had the no in order to win was a rather small one. And 63% of Colombians didn't go to the polls. They stay at home, they didn't vote, we don't know what they are thinking. And I believe that if you go around walking the streets of different regions of Colombia today, and you see how the impact of the peace deal has had in their lives, most of them, even though they don't agree with 100% of the agreement, most of them, they they see a real impact in their lives and they would support what the FARC and the government Understood. are doing. Understood. So Andre, I think what Andre, we will uh, see... Let me jump in uh, here for a second. Sure, let me jump in here for a second. Wouldn't it be better to take their concerns seriously rather than saying maybe they were misinformed before the plebiscite? Because in this seat, I've heard it about Brexit. I've heard that people were misinformed. That's why they voted one way or the other. I've heard it with regards voting for Donald Trump or any number of elections, isn't it better to say, OK, we, we accept and understand that the majority, by a slim majority, were against this. We have to work hard to win you over, rather than assuming that they were misinformed before the plebiscite. No, I do believe that we need to have a different way of understanding this. We are entering in an era of post-truth politics, what many people and many scholars are calling it that way. And I think we need to really be a bit more, you know, accurate about the information that is shared uh, to the public. And I believe that Twitter, WhatsApp, and all the social networks have had a serious impact on misinforming people in order to take decisions about their future. Um, so, in my view, we really need to make clear that the consensus was that, that it was a really rather small majority. And, of course, the president accepted the, the majority there and decided to renegotiate with the FARC and to take on board some of the concerns of the no. But overall, there was a very serious misinformation campaign that informed people's decision in terms of the peace process. Okay. Darinell, some FARC members say that they need their weapons 
because they're being attacked by right-wing paramilitaries and some criminal gangs. Do you believe them? Well, in order to understand this, uh, uh, the logic of this decision, you have to take into consideration two factors. First is uh, the history of past demobilization processes in Colombia. And you, if you look at the 1980s, 1990s, and you see efforts of uh, the FARC itself to become into, to transition into a political party, uh, you find that there, was, uh, there were 5,000 militants from this party who were killed, including three presidential candidates and several members of Congress. Hence, it is understanding from behalf of the FARC that they have concerns about their security. Second uh, element is the current context in which the peace process is taking place. This is not a clean-cut uh, peace process between two parties. There is, yes, an agreement that is, uh, uh, has been reached with the FARC, and they are starting the process to demobilize. But at the same time, there are still uh, a big number of armed actors, irregular armed actors, who are still active, uh, who still and um, exercising high levels of violence, and um, that many of them pose a threat to the FARC. Mm -hmm. So there are legitimate concerns about their safety, and that is what uh, this point of the agreement is trying to do, is trying to alleviate those concerns, to speak to those concerns, to provide confidence about the will of the government to actually carry on with the agreements. Right. Now, we're lucky enough to have had someone on the ground among the FARC fighters. Let's bring in TRT World correspondent Annelise Borges, who just spent time in Colombia covering the FARC. Annelise... You were among the fighters, or ex-fighters, if there's a, going to be a comprehensive peace deal, in one of those 26 demobilization camps. Tell me what it was like and what they told you. I think one of the most interesting quotes that I heard from this peace process was actually not said there. It was said in Bogota. A, a professor told me that it was a messy war, so surely enough it would be a messy peace process. And as your guests have been mm -hmm. reflecting, it's, it's been a messy process. The atmosphere in uh, the, the camp we visited, at least, I can't, uh, um, I can't respond for all the camps, but the camp that we visited, uh, what struck me the most is how, was how relaxed everybody was. Uh, people were, of course, they had a long list of complaints, of um, things that they would like to see change. Of course, this is the first contact the FARC have with the bureaucracy in Colombia. But most of them, or at least every single FARC member that I spoke to, said that they were quite committed to peace. They were ready to do everything in their power to push this process forward, to engage in politics. Uh, uh, the reason why most of them had joined the FARC in the first place, and that is, mm -hmm. of course, again, according to uh, these fighters. We, uh, it was actually quite interesting because... Um, one of the anecdotes that I have from there is that the very first contact that I had with a FARC fighter was this uh, man approaching me with both of his hands in his belly saying that that was the price to, peace, to pay for peace because they were no longer <laughs> running away from uh, the army, so they were quite ecstatic, so they were putting on weight. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Andre, you hear that now from, you know, Annalise on the ground, she's speaking to the FARC fighters and they're saying they're optimistic about the prospects for peace. But then I spoke to... Senator Paloma Valencia very recently, and she was saying the problem isn't so much a peace deal, but is the fact that she and other Colombians feel that people won't be paying the price that they should be paying for the crimes that they committed. How do you actually get that peace with justice when so many people feel there's an injustice at play, Andre? Well, I think we, what you are just asking me shows the importance of doing lots of pedagogy in terms of transitional justice. Transitional justice is not an easy process. It's a process that involves, you know, many different actions, not only sending people to prison. prison. And I believe that many Colombians haven't really understood what it means to try to demobilize the FARC and to respect and to honor and satisfy the rights of the victims that are truth, justice, uh, non-repetition, and reparations. And the comprehensive agreement with the FARC, it doesn't just focus on uh, you know, the people telling the truth, but it focuses on, also on reparations programs for the victims. And I think that's really, really important. And a negotiation is a deal that you reach with your enemy. You don't, you don't mm -hmm. actually impose conditions on the other, but you need to reach a middle ground where you actually help 
managed to move forward. And I think that's what President Santos did. And the main problem with Paloma Valencia and that sector of Colombians is that they are not willing to meet the other sector of Colombian society. We, with Rodemos El Dialogo, and many members of society have gone to the Zonas Veredales, to the concentration camps, and have talked to the guerrilla fighters. And as your guest speaker was saying, um, we found that they are just human beings. They are Colombians that are willing to put an end to the war and that they are willing to actually help the reparation of the victims and move on. Okay. And I think that's the very Good serious point. challenge that we are facing at this moment. And probably in the future, they will be a rather small minority. Okay, interesting point. Annalise, I'm curious, what are their thoughts about what happens next? If there is, you know, complete disarmament, as we expect, and a comprehensive peace process, where do they go? What sort of lives do they lead? It's very interesting because I put that question to every single person I met at that camp. I said, what are you going to do next? Where are you going to go? Are you going to go back home? And they looked at me very puzzled because there is no home. The FARC is their home. For many of them, many of the men and women I spoke to have had grew up in the FARC, had grew up in the FARC, had spent most of their uh, life with the group, and they kept saying that what happens to them now is going to be determined by the group, that they are ready to uh, be given whatever job the FARC needs them to do. Uh, most of them are very, very excited about being a part of this uh, political movement, uh, fighting a new battle, this time as a sanctioned political actor. They said, most of them don't really have a family to go back to. Some of them are actually scared for their families. They would rather not go back to their families right now so that their families are not a target by, um, of those uh, paramilitary uh, groups. So most of them say they're not going to leave. They are actually not planning on leaving the Zonas Veredales, these transition camps that are now becoming more and more permanent. Right. And they hope that they can be given a job by the FARC uh, this time in politics. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to, to see what happens to those camps, 26 of them. They're now very fi finally, because I've got, a, I've got a wrap, do you believe that enough of a cross-section of Colombian society, whether right or left or rich or poor or urban or rural, believes in this transitional justice system moving forward? Well, there, I mean, there is clearly... Uh division in Colombian society. You know, the peace process has been a factor of polarization. Uh, and indeed, there is, uh, um, we have to make all Colombians, I think, an effort to build bridges and to rebuild trust. Trust um, on, uh, trust that, you know, the former FARC rebels will incorporate and will honor their piece of the deal. Trust that the institutions will be able to respond. Trust that we can de uh, define a future together as Colombians. So while there is a lot of resistance on behalf of some group, and that's something uh, that we need to acknowledge, we have to um, show how those, to have to start a process of delegiti delegitimizing those concerns, showing mm -hmm. that there is an actual will of peace on behalf of the, of the FARC and also on behalf of the government to do that. And, um, it's all about uh, building trust, reinforcing uh, uh, the confidence in the peace process, uh, preventing uh, dissidents. Um, and, and actually, this, in that regard, the peace process has been quite modelic at the moment. Now, usually mm. in this kind of processes, you expect about 20% dissidents. The dissidents in this case has been about 4%, yeah. uh, which point. shows that the FARC are very highly structured. Yeah, that's a and, really good and point. And respond to, to command. Yeah, unfortunately, I've got a wrap, but yeah, Colombia, could it be on the brink? of a proper peace, we'll be watching it very closely. One of the most beautiful things I read about the weapons, once they're handed in, some of the weapons will be melted down to create peace sculptures commemorating more than 50 years of war. That's, that's quite beautiful. Annalise, uh, Darnell and Andre, thanks so much for joining us. I've got to move on. Human Rights Watch says Russian authorities inside of Crimea are cracking down on the peninsula's Tatar community. There are centuries-old Turkic-speaking people, mostly Muslim, who say they're being targeted and oppressed. More and more Tatar leaders are being jailed, along with activists who have spoken out against the local Russian-backed government. Tens of thousands of Tatars have fled Crimea since the Russian takeover. But they're also fighting for recognition in Ukraine, where nationalists are afraid of Tatar calls for autonomy. So what's in store for the Tatars' future? In a moment, we'll be joined by the chief executive for the Crimean Tatar government, but first, Sandra Gutman sent us this report from Kiev. We 
жили около 8 месяцев в депортации, то есть мы уехали где-то в, в ноябре 2014 -го года. Я до последнего держалась, не хотела уезжать, потому что считала, что это предательство. Elmira and her family are ethnic Tatars from Crimea. They're among 50,000 Muslim Tatars who fled the peninsula after Russia annexed it in 2014. It's a wound reopened. In the 1940s, nearly half a million ethnic Tatars were deported from Crimea under Stalin rule. When the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1980s, many returned. Tatars now make up around 12% of Crimea's population. They consider it to be their homeland. Mustafa Kirimolu was a Tatar leader during the Soviet era and spent 15 years in prison. He now lives in exile and helps run the Crimean Tatar legislative body from Kiev. When Russians invaded us, they took our democratic rights. Media, television, everything is under their control. Nothing can be spoken without their permission. I'm often asked what can the international community do to help Crimean Tatars. I say in order to help Crimean Tatars and secure their future, we need to stop the occupation. There is no other way. Today, the Crimean Peninsula is largely closed off and remains under strict Russian control. A majority of Crimea's Tatars opposed the Kremlin's 2014 takeover. And rights groups say members of the Muslim minority group are paying the price. The situation is getting worse and worse in terms of human rights. Now, uh, we see that uh, de facto authorities, they actually target not only um, leaders of the Majlis, like the most the prominent people, but they target only local activists, they target only regular people that at some point show that they don't agree with, uh, with official politics. But Russia sees Tatar leaders as extremists. They point to evidence of Tatars working with Ukrainian nationalists to cut off power lines, block roads, and torture Crimeans living on the peninsula. More than 25 Tatar leaders are now behind bars, charged with separatism. Back in Kiev, there's some talk of creating a future autonomous region for Crimean Tatars. The Ukrainian government now recognizes the group as an indigenous people. But what Crimean Tatars ultimately want is to return home. They very love Krim, my children, they Мы обязательно вернемся в Крым, если Крым вернется обратно в Украину. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers, Kiev. Well, joining us in the studio to better explain the Tatars' predicament is the chief of staff for Crimea's government in exile, Arsen Jumadilov. Thanks so much for flying out from Kiev to be here with us. Uh, it's good to have you on the program. What is the clearest evidence that you can present that Crimean Tatars are being persecuted actively by Russia? The, I would name just the, the most recent one, the deputy head of the Majlis of the Crimean Tatar people, which is the government of the Crimean Tatars, who is held uh, under the arrest for two and a half years now, and the trial is s still ongoing. He was rejected his plea to see his terminally ill mother, just because they the, the Russian occupational authorities in Crimea, they want to show that the Crimean Tatars are deprived of, of whatever human right you can imagine. That's the most recent one. If you take the statistics, you see that almost 10% of the Crimean Tatars living in Crimea fled the place. Not just because of the economic situation which is dire there, despite the promises of, of, uh, of the Russian Federation that they will uh, make a uh, a pearl out of Crimea, it will shine uh, for the rest of the world. Predominantly because of uh, the fears that they will be persecuted as their neighbors. Mm. And uh, you see now leading international organizations stating very 
clearly that there is a massive human rights abuse in Crimea, including first and foremost the General Assembly of the United Nations, which adopted respected, uh, respective resolution last year, December. Right, and Human Rights Watch as well that we heard from right. there. Sergei Aksyonov, the head of the Republic of Crimea, says, quote, all Russian citizens residing in Crimea enjoy equal rights. Crimean Tatars are not oppressed. We have organized systematic Hajj trips. We are constructing a cathedral mosque. And he went on to talk about other rights. Right. Well, how would you respond to him directly if he was watching this? Uh, I would say to him that uh, the Russians are very good at creating images. And now the whole world uh, is aware of that. But when you see uh, the situation deeper, when you know the situation from inside, you see that uh, this is a story for the outside world. Whereas in Crimea, uh, the people there, the Crimean Tatars, they cannot feel safe when they go to the mosque because right after the Juma prayer, the, the Friday prayer, uh, they can be uh, they can be arrested by uh, FSB by the militia. Their uh, their fingerprints will be taken. Their silver for DNA test will be taken, and they feel that they are always under watch. That you cannot make a move. You cannot post uh, anything on social media where you will doubt that the illegal annexation uh, or of Crimea by Russia in 2014 was a good idea. But is that for all those who are non-Russian supporting or especially Crimean Tatars? I mean, what you're saying, can't that, okay, they might not be going to the mosque, but what if you're a Ukrainian who's against the, the Russian annexation and you post something on social media? You'd probably face the same. You will be treated Wouldn't the you? same way, but there is a special feeling uh, in Russia towards the Crimean Tatars, which is, it was not a takeover, it was a hostile takeover. They uh, were always after Crimea because for some reason, Putin in his head, he sees Crimea as, um, as a birthplace of Russian nation, whatever myth he has in his head. And the Crimean Tatars are the only ones who, uh, who contradict the story, who make the story fall apart. Because the Crimean Tatars are the indigenous people of the peninsula. They've been there for centuries, and they are the only ones uh, who have the right for self-determination, mm -hmm. which Putin said that in 2014 the people of Crimea enjoyed. There is nothing like a people of Crimea. There is the Crimean Tatar people and the residents of Crimea. And it is the Crimean Tatar people who have the right for self-determination. I watched an interview uh, where, uh, from 2015, where it was for Ukraine Today. And you said quite clearly on there that you supported an economic blockade of Crimea, which involved tactics of sabotage. Do you still support economic blockade? I still support it. And uh, I would say that um, it is not just about the economics. It is, first of all, about the psychology. The Crimea Tatars live in Crimea. In, two in 2014, they asked numerous times, they were asking Ukraine, why are you trading with Crimea? It, it, is, uh, it is the trade on blood, made on blood. You should stop it. Because uh, it, you, it looked like as if Business as usual. Nothing happened. Sure. For but, us, but for the Crimean hurt, Tatars. Wouldn't that hurt other Crimean Tatars, other Crimean people, blowing up of pipelines and stuff? That's why the Russians see it as sabotage and extremism, right? Uh, what about those people who rely on that lifeline? Forget the government for a second. Wouldn't it hurt the very people you're claiming to help? Well, that's a, a flawed logic of the Russians. Uh, I mean, you cannot imagine Hitler, for example, to ask Stalin or to ask, for example, Churchill, why are you cutting the supply lines of anything to us when he occupied France, for instance? You cannot imagine him asking this. But you see the Russians uh, who ask this uh, for mm -hmm. Ukraine. They occupied the territory. They seized it. It was not a takeover. It, it, it was not a referendum or something like that. It was a military aggression. It was an occupation. And it is already called directly as an illegal annexation. It is uh, a wording that is used by the UN. So it is now a, a term used for uh, mm -hmm. the situation there. Does it make you feel uncomfortable that there are members from the right sector who are also supportive and involved in the blockade and the sabotage? Because some of them are neo-Nazis. They hate Tatars, but they're on your side when it comes to this particular thing. Look, uh, the, uh, we, now we are on the same boat uh, with every single citizen of Ukraine which feels that 
the territorial integrity of his or her country was, uh, was undermined. So uh, we will fight side by side with them for the restoration of the territorial integrity. Even if they're a neo-Nazi? Uh, the thing is that this neo-Nazi story, it is uh, overestimated. It is, uh, you see these stories you know, covered very often uh, by Sputnik or Russia Today, but uh, in the reality, take, for example, presidential elections 2014 in Ukraine. The leader of the right sector, he didn't even take 1% of the vote. Whereas the, the current president of Ukraine took 50-something percent of the world. So that's uh, the popular support of those movements. Okay, so forgetting Crimea for a second, President Poroshenko supporting the creation of, quote, the autonomous Crimean Tatar Republic in the mainland of Ukraine, forgetting Crimea. Wouldn't that hurt your chances of ever returning to Crimea, of that being the, the, the kind of spiritual homeland of the Tatar people if they give you an autonomous region elsewhere? Very important note. We are not talking and we have never been talking about an autonomy on the mainland Ukraine. We are talking about an autonomy in Crimea as soon as it is de uh, as soon as it is deoccupied and that liberated. Happen? I mean the Russians aren't going to go anywhere in it will the next year, ultimately. 10 years. The sanctions work. Uh, the Putin's regime, it is, uh, it is not that solid rock as it was three, four years ago. I spoke, so to Poroshenko, once. I spoke to Poroshenko a year and four months ago. I asked him, when are you going to get Crimea back? He said, we're going to get it back before the end of the year. 2016 came and went. We have the patience. And we know that as soon as Crimea is liberated, as soon as it is free, mm. we, the Crimean Tatars, we should enjoy a wider range of rights than, uh, than we used to have uh, 23 years before when Crimea was de facto mm -hmm. under control of Ukraine. So that's uh, what we are now about. We, are, we want uh, the Crimean Tatar autonomy to be created in Crimea and it will be put in place, it will be implemented as soon as the peninsula is liberated. Back to the right sector and those others on the right, they're against the creation of an autonomous Tatar Republic because they feel their country will be broken up. Do you respect that? You said that you side with them if they're against the Russian annexation of Crimea. Are you sympathetic to what they're saying here? I said that I side with every citizen of Ukraine right. which feels strong about the territorial integrity of uh, his or her, or her country. Uh, as for their stance on, on the autonomy, uh, there is one very important point that uh, we, the Crimean Tatars, we have always been declaring that we want this autonomy to be an integral part of Ukraine. We have never called for uh, secession for a, a separatist move out of Ukraine. So we want to be very clear. We want Crimea to be a part of Ukraine as a Crimean Tatar autonomy. That's it, full stop. Has the annexation made the Crimean Tatar people feel more nationalistic as Ukrainians? Uh, I would say that uh, it made the Ukrainians feel more like Crimean Tatars. We have always been feeling that we are citizens of Ukraine, but we felt that we are, to a certain extent, we, are, we were mistreated by the Ukrainians and uh, by Ukrainian governments, which were changing a lot in Kiev. But now we see that the Ukrainians, they have changed their view and, and their opinion about the Crimean Tatars. Now they do believe that we are on the same boat, that the Crimean Tatars are not a threat that the Crimea Tatars are friends and we should go side by side in this struggle. Is President Poroshenko on the right track when it comes to the situation of the Crimean Tatars? He is, and that is a very good news for us. Mm -hmm. What can he do better? Probably many things. Uh, I would say that uh, we will uh, see the results of all his promises, uh, whether he will deliver on them or not in... Uh, one year time probably. In one year time it will be very much clear whether it is all about rhetoric mm -hmm. uh, or it is about real intentions. Final question, how important is it to you that there's solidarity from countries like Turkey and elsewhere? It is very much important. Uh, no secret that Turkey for us is of utmost importance, not just because uh, it is a brotherly nation mm. uh, whom uh, we see so, but also because Turkey is a regional leader. And uh, Turkey's stance on the illegal annexation of Crimea is very much important for the, the ultimate goal that uh, we are on to liberate Crimea. 
did it worry you when Turkey and Russia came closer together after the fallout of the Russian jet being taken out of the sky? Uh, it does worry us uh, whenever any country gets closer with Russia, especially Turkey. But I do believe and, and we do see that uh, the country's leadership, I mean Turkey's leadership, mm. uh, is very clear on their position about Crimea, that it is illegally annexed, it was occupied, it should be given back. Arsen Jumadilov, it's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.